Hello everyone, so my name is Florian, I'm a researcher at the IRAP in Toulouse, and today I will present to you the atmospherics uh, program that is dedicated on the atmospheric investigation uh, of exoplanets. Uh, so I want to thank uh, Eder and Olivia because they have uh, said a lot of things that will make my life much easier and will allow me to stick to the time uh, allowed. Okay, so for today, I will first go through a context of uh, what I'm going to present and then show you the observations we got uh, up to today and, of course, uh, the perspective uh, at the end. So, uh, last decade was uh, really the decade of planetary uh, discovery. Uh, so, in 2009, we knew 4,000 exoplanets, and in 2022, we have reached numbers higher than 5,000. So this is an example of uh, their uh, mass as a function of the orbital period and eccentricity in color. And what you see is that they span a very huge range of uh, different physical condition. Uh, from this, uh, and although this uh, study are still ongoing and we are going to more and more difficult tar targets, we already have access to newer statistics. And I think uh, Claire presented it uh, earlier today. One of them, uh, of the most famous, is uh, what's called the Fulton Gap, uh, which basically shows that there is a dip in the number of planets uh, with a certain size. And this uh, dip of planets uh, is associated to uh, the presence or the absence of a large atmosphere here until you have a transition uh, between rocky world and um, water world. This is at least uh, what is uh, believed today. And uh, one of the big questions um, for the future is to, to confirm this uh, observationally. So unfortunately, if you just have the radius and the mass, there is a huge uh, degeneracy in composition. And uh, this is a well-known plot from Valencia et al. in 2013. Uh, this is a tertiary plot where you have the composition of water here, of Earth-like nucleus, and of uh, hydrogen and helium uh, following the three axes. And uh, you have the gray lines are the, the constant uh, radius uh, lines. So for example, a radius of five Earth masses, you could either have 80% of water and 20% of hydrogen and helium and zero Earth-like nucleus, or at the opposite, you could have 80% of Earth-like nucleus and 20% uh, of hydrogen and helium or something like that. So there is a huge, huge degeneracy of the composition if you just have the density. And so, to lift this degeneracy, we don't have uh, much choice, unfortunately. And so this is why, after a decade of uh, planetary discovery, we're really entering a decade of uh, atmospheric characterization. Indeed, if you're able to characterize the atmospheres of this planet, you might have enough information to decipher between the different possibilities of composition. So from there, there's a flowering of ground-based instruments uh, to characterize atmospheres, and of course, there is a launch of uh, GWST that will look among many other things at planetary atmospheres and Ariel, which is dedicated to this task in 2029. Uh, so for today, I will only talk about what we call transmission spectroscopy, which is a method to characterize the atmospheres. And uh, basically, Olivia mentioned it, as the planet passes in front of its star, it's going to absorb the light in a wavelength dependent manner. So if you've got some different elements in your planet, for example, some water, it's going to uh, appear as a very big planet with a large radius in the absorption band of water, whereas it's going to appear as a very smaller planet where there is no uh, strong absorbers. So from space, uh, it started in the early 2000s, and you have an example here from Spake et al. in 2019, where you see that the radius of the planet is uh, wavelength dependent. So you see here the Rayleigh slope uh, of uh, the, the, diff the Rayleigh diffusion on the new planet. And then you have some strong bands of absorption, which are due to different elements. So here it's potassium and uh, water, uh, for example. From the ground, it's much more difficult. You don't have uh, the same uh, um, characteristic of your planet, and you don't see exactly the radius in the, such a beautiful way. And uh, the first uh, detection has been performed in 2010 by Snellen, where they observed the uh, carbon monoxide in HG209. And uh, it has been uh, improving very fast uh, since then. So low resolution spectroscopy, so from space, uh, has a broad wavelength coverage, is not uh, prevented by TRX, and you can see the global slope of your planetary spectrum, so giving access, for example, to the Rayleigh scattering. And on the other hand, your high resolution spectroscopy from the ground resolve individual lines. It can see above clouds, where low resolution spectroscopy is completely limited. 
And it can also have access to wind dynamics, which is linked to a lot of physical processes happening in the planet. So in a sense, the low and high resolution spectroscopy techniques are complementary to characterize atmospheres, and we really need them both if we want to understand at depth the physics of planetary atmospheres and so the physics of planetary formation and evolution. And there's actually the first framework to combine these techniques that has emerged in the, in the, the recent years. There is in the, indeed a paper that is soon to be submitted uh, from uh, the Canadian part of the SLS that combine uh, Spiro observation with uh, Hubble observation through this framework. And so speaking about Spiro, why do we want to use Spiro for uh, atmospheric characterization? Well, the, I think this slide from Matteo Brogi, which is not a Spiro user, is a rather a Giano and the Carmenes user, uh, is a very uh, good uh, example. It shows the expected signal to noise uh, for each of the main uh, near infrared spectrograph used for exoplanet characterization today. And what you can see is that Spiro is expected to be largely better than any of the other spectrograph uh, that exist on Earth uh, so far. And why is that? It's because it has one shot coverage of a large band. It has a high precision due to its capacity to do a velocimetry. And of course, there is a, the Hawaiian site, which is probably the best site in the world uh, when you compare to these other instruments. And so coupled all this, you obtain that for this kind of uh, objective, Spiru is the best instrument in the world today. So from then, we have uh, created a large consortium, a French-led consortium of 27 members, which we've called Atmospherics. So you see here it's uh, composed of 12, well, all these people from 12 different universities. Uh, so we have also foreign universities because, well, PhD and postdocs tend to move a bit. Uh, and uh, we have gathered observers, theoreticians, and the idea is really to to gather the most knowledge we can have and the most uh, numerous tools to be able to exploit at best the capability of Spiru uh, to understand planetary atmospheres. So what we're doing is we're doing this uh, high resolution spectroscopy observation of transitory planet in the near infrared. And what is really interesting is that because of this large consortium, we are able to get uh, quite a lot of time. And so we have a consistent multi-target procedure. And this is becoming more and more important because with the flowering of instrument and observation, there is also a flowering of conflicting studies and different results. And so having a consistent approach to many different targets is uh, gonna bring some, uh, yeah, some consistency uh, in, the, in the results. So our three main goals, uh, which can be achieved with Spiro, is first to detect molecules in the atmosphere of this planet. And uh, molecules will give you information about the composition, formation, and evolution. Then we want to know the pressure temperature profile and the amplitude of winds. This is linked to the uh, physical processes that are happening in this planet. And we will learn a lot uh, about these processes through uh, high resolution spectroscopy. And finally, because uh, Spiru also has a line of the metastable helium triplet uh, in its uh, wavelength domain, we can have an information about the escaping or extended atmosphere and so uh, with helium Doppler spectroscopy, uh, we have a lot of information on the evolution of planets which are very close into their star. Uh, of course, if you lose some mass, this is gonna affect uh, a lot of the planet and uh, the helium Doppler spectroscopy gives you some proxies of this mass loss as I will uh, show it again a bit later. Okay, so that was uh, for the context. And so regarding the observation and results, so we really started observing uh, at the first uh, at the beginning of 2020 and we secured uh, eight targets through the atmospheric programs. And uh, the color for the mass, so the red one are Jupiter globally uh, gas giant planets, the green one are ice giants, and the blue ones are terrestrial uh, planets, uh, at least in mass. And TOE, uh, this one, TOI 1807, has no mass yet, so we are still trying to figure out exactly. So we have these eight targets, and in addition, we have uh, a few and uh, uh, Spiro legacy survey targets that helped us to create uh, our data analysis tool and uh, uh, which we characterize first. So how do we do it? So Olivia uh, mentioned it a bit. Um, we have uh, an open source data analysis code that will be published uh, in a paper, hopefully uh, as soon as possible. And basically on this plot, you see the orbital phase. So the time, okay, for each row is a spectra as Olivia mentioned as a function of wavelengths. And you see that these are your raw data. 
And in the first step, you want to get rid completely of the stellar and telluric contamination. And then you get to a, a spectra that is still dominated by the correlated noise, noise as the planet is buried under it. And so we have some data-driven method to go a step further. And we get to this final uh, reduced spectra. So unfortunately, as you can see, the synthetic planet signature, so the planet we would expect look like that. And it's clearly not visible in this uh, spectra with, in, this, uh, in these observations, which look like uh, a map of uh, white noise, actually. So the only way to get back to the planet signature, Olivia mentioned it, is to correlate a synthetic planet with the observation and to find that the maximum of correlation is representative of the composition and the physics of the atmosphere. So for that, we first have to create an atmospheric model. And depending on what we want to put inside this model, we either go to an isothermal model with a constant composition, or we can take into account many physical processes. In our team, we have some experts of uh, the 3D structure of, um, of atmosphere. And so we can uh, input the real impact of uh, atmospheric circulation and, for example, the photochemistry on this planet. And uh, we have, yes, yeah, depending on the level of complexity and the quality of our data, we can go to different uh, physics uh, in our synthetic model. Once we have this uh, static synthetic model, we need to, uh, to make it evolve with time exactly as the planet is orbiting its star. So at the beginning of the transit, the planet is going towards the observer. So you have a blue shift uh, of your spectra. And at the end of the transit, the planet is going away. So you have a red shift. And so this leads to a global slope in the time wavelength uh, space. And so we create this slope. Um, and we make a lot of different uh, uh, slopes just to be sure that the maximum of correlation is indeed associated with the theoretical orbital speed. Because we know the theoretical orbital speed from the mass ratio of the star and planet and the orbital period. And so if we find the maximum of correlation, which is very different from the orbital speed, it means that it's not a detection. It's just a, a fortuitous uh, maximum of correlation. So to say that in a more simplified manner, if our model was perfect, we would find that the maximum of correlation is associated with a theoretical orbital speed and that uh, the non-orbital Doppler shift, so this is basically the phenomena that we forgot to take into account, is exactly zero because our model uh, is perfect here. And so we've done it uh, to the two most studied planets uh, so far, so HD189 and HD209, with a model that was a very simple model here, isothermal, just containing water. And we obtain a four to five sigma detection of, of water in this planet. So you see that the, the green line are the theoretical uh, position. So the orbital speed, you should have your maximum of correlation very close to the theoretical detection. And it works perfectly well for HD189. It works a bit uh, less for HD209, uh, but it's still in the uncertainties of, of our method. And you see that the Doppler shift here is never at uh, zero. So it means that we did not take into account uh, the wind and the planet. And there are some physical aspects uh, which, are, um, which we don't have here. And uh, interestingly, so we find the same result as uh, Bush et al. 21, which was the first results for HG189 published from Spiro data. Uh, but like her, we find a stronger blue shift than the rest of the literature. So it either means that we have stronger winds for during our observation or that there are differences in the spectrograph uh, on the ground. And we are still trying to find out where, where does that come from. But still, first result, we have a secure detection of water on these uh, two planets, which is in line with what you have in the rest of the literature. But what, when you want to go to other molecules for this planet, you, the trouble is that they have much less impact uh, on the spectrum. So you see here a model of HG, uh, of, sorry, WASP-127, for example, with only water. You have the planetary radius as a function of wavelengths. And here we included a lot of different species. And you see that visually speaking, these two models look uh, very much alike. There, is, there are two big differences actually in these models, and they are due to uh, the carbon monoxide in these two regions. But the problem is that there are some carbon monoxide in the star as well. And so when we will correlate our model with the data, the first thing we will actually see is the stellar carbon monoxide. So once we have uh, perform this very easy first step, let's say, not easy, but this first step of detecting water. If we want to go a step further, we need two things. We need data-driven method like a Monte Carlo uh, algorithm to uh, explore the likelihood and so to have some constraint and so error bars on our detection. And we need to correct for stellar contamination 
and notably from what, for what we call the rossiter McLaughlin effect. So the fact that uh, if there are some elements in the star and in the planet, the first one we will see here will be the stellar elements. So considering uh, this correction, we have applied actually this correction on the HG189. And how we done that, we enjoyed the fact that Andrea Kiavasa is part of our team and he provided us realistic uh, stellar spectra of HG189. And so we suppressed this spectra from the observation to get rid of all uh, the CO lines during the transit. And so what that leads is that if you are correlating a, a model with a uh, carbon monoxide, without the Kiavasa and Brogi correction, you see that you do have a maximum of correlation at the expected position, but it's leaking towards very different orbital speed. And so this is uh, completely non-physical. Whereas when you apply the correction from uh, Kiavasa and Brogi 2019, you see that basically all these leaks are completely disappearing and you get back to your maximum co of correlation at the right position. And this secures the detection of planetary carbon monoxide. And now what we are trying to do is to find out whether there are differences in the, in the, in the carbon monoxide and water content in this planet. So going uh, again on, on these differences and on this composition, we've done, uh, we've uh, used um, data-driven method. And here we've used a nested sampling algorithm, which is called Pi Multinest. And I'm sorry, I forgot the citation uh, on WASP76b. And you see here is that we have a very uh, nice detection of water and carbon monoxide. So this is a probability distribution as a function of the mass mixing ratio of water and carbon monoxide on this planet. And uh, we have uh, an estimate of the error bars on our detection here. And what is really interesting, and it confirms the fact that Spiro is really the best instrument in the world, is that there are some other uh, publication of uh, infrared instrument looking at this planet, and they never detected carbon uh, monoxide and water with such a precision. Uh, they always uh, had some, uh, some issues in the detection of water, which was not at the good position, etc was we had a really clean detection of these two species uh, on the first try with Peru. On the same planet, uh, we had uh, the possibility to look at the escaping helium. Uh, unfortunately, for just one transit, we couldn't confirm, but it looks like there is an excess of absorption here at the right position, although not enough to constrain exactly the extended atmosphere. And so that was done first by uh, Aurelien Wittenbach, which, but he has left academia. So it's uh, taken back by another student of our team. And we are trying to uh, constrain the escaping helium uh, on WASP-1766b. And so the evolution of this planet, which is extremely close to its star, so which is extremely uh, heated. OK, so that's uh, a kind of a tour of our observation and results. And so what I want to say is that after a bit more than three semesters, we have stopped to be in the working phase, let's say uh, in the development phase, and we have now reached the production phase where there will be a publication about all the works we've, we've provided. We have five planets which can be already characterized, and for the six of the one, we need to acquire more uh, transit, uh, but it's just a, a matter of time. And uh, among them, there are two interesting uh, aspects I would like to mention. The first one is, as I showed, we have two planets with a characterization of both water and CO. And what that means is that with an appropriate chemical model, we could go back to the elemental C2O ratio. And the C2O ratio is a huge marker of the formation and evolution of the planet. And so we, we have the possibility to uh, do this um, uh, ratio for already two planets, and we are uh, expecting to do more in the future. Another really interesting aspect is that for WASP-1766b, which I mentioned a lot, there are some theories that uh, the evening part of the planet is much colder than the morning. And it leads to the fact that in the morning, the temperature is so hot that the iron is completely in a gaseous state, whereas it could condense back and uh, form some iron clad or, or be depleted in the iron in the evening part. And so there are a lot of uh, uh, other explanations, but it has really been a, a, a shock to the community for this, uh, this model. And what's interesting is that in October 2021, we secured a simultaneous transit of this planet, both in the visible, where iron is uh, detectable, and in the infrared with Peru, where we can see the water and the, uh, the carbon monoxide. So we are still uh, studying it, but basically with this two probe in infrared and visible, we have the chance to scan different pressure and temperature range. And hopefully 
to be able to decipher between uh, circulation, clouds, or an eccentricity origin for the peculiar observation of uh, Ehrenreich et al. in 2020. Uh, last word on this is that uh, it, uh, it's actually a good prospect for the future is that it could be done all the time uh, if vision was on CFHT, uh, because we will have simultaneous visible and infrared observation uh, with any uh, transit observation from Spirou and Espadon. So it's a nice and interesting prospect for the future for exoplanet characterization. Last but not least, uh, we have gathered this huge French team and the future is to try to do the same with the Canadian team around Spirou. And so there has been a submission of an atmospheric large program uh, if it's accepted. And the idea is to explore the mass and equilibrium temperature parameter of space and to find out whether we can uh, find some trends or some differences uh, in this, uh, the, the atmospheric physics of this planet. And you see that the planet in color are the planets that are proposed uh, in this large program. And so they really uh, sample this space uh, and there's a lot of physics to be done here. But what's also very promising for such a work is that we will be, we stop being limited by the number of transit because now we always are at the limit of detection. And uh, as Olivia showed as well, if you have not enough transit or just enough, it's not uh, very easy to make a, um, a claim. But Jacob et al. 2021, for example, on AG209, they had five transit. And with five transit, it's much more than enough to do a very, very clean detection of all the species in the, in the atmosphere. And this is a, one of the objectives as well of this program is to be able to have a lot of transit for all these targets and so to have some very secured uh, claim of atmospheric characterization. Okay, so in conclusion, I've shown that uh, we have entered really the decade of atmospheric characterization uh, and that Spirou to date is the best instrument worldwide to do it. And it has really started to be productive uh, for exoplanet atmospheres. I didn't mention, but there is also um, a characterization of Tobubi by, by Peltier et al. in 2021. And uh, uh, I've shown that there is a huge complementarity with space-based instruments such as GWST and Ariel. So Spirou might not exist anymore in 2000, or not in CFHT at least uh, at, the, at this date, but if it does, it will be a very nice uh, combination to enjoy Spirou and Ariel at the same time. And uh, we hope to be uh, using, uh, like performing this large program with many physical objectives. And so hopefully you will hear about us more uh, in the near future. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Florian, for keeping your talk within the time. So thank you very much again. Thank you. So, and the uh, next talk is by Pia Cortez-Sureta.